When we do, Lord, we look to you as our teacher, as our Savior, as the one who loves us, and uh, help us understand this morning your scriptures in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, if you turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 22, we're going to be uh, continuing in this uh, very important parable that the Lord spoke here about a marriage, a wedding. So, uh, uh, Matthew 22, we'll just read the first few verses here uh, to get a context, and we're really going to be centering on verses 6 through 13, but we'll start with verse 1 to get the full picture. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son, and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again, he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden. Behold, I prepared my dinner, my ox, and my fatlings are killed. All things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it and went their ways, and one to to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. But when when the king heard thereof, he was wroth. He sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen." Okay, now in this section, the Lord Jesus is still speaking. We've got to remember, he's still speaking to his enemies that he encountered in the last chapter. He's going to keep on speaking to them all the way through chapter 25. This is an ongoing discourse here. And now the Lord is speaking to his enemies through this parable. It's a precious parable because it's a parable that on the surface, it's about a king's son, a boy who's taking to himself a bride. Great. But what makes this parable so precious is that it's all about the Lord Jesus Christ taking to himself a bride, and the bride is his people, the church. So what the Lord Jesus is talking about in this parable is very precious to him, very dear to him, just as dear as as to a man when he speaks about his preciousness and the dearness of his wife. This is speaking right out of Revelation 21.9, Revelation 21.9, which says, Come hither, and I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. It's speaking right out of Ephesians 5.23, Ephesians 5, Ephesians 5, where it says, The husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he's the Savior of the body. And then Ephesians 5.25, Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy without Blemish, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. See, these are precious subjects. These are precious, very intimate, very personal subjects about a husband loving his wife as his own body, a husband giving himself wholly for his wife, a husband washing and cleansing his wife, a husband adorning his wife so that he can present her to himself in all of her beauty. Very personal very intimate subjects that the Lord Jesus is alluding to in this parable as he speaks through the symbolism of a marriage of a king's son. 
And, and, and he's saying all of this to his enemies. He's saying all of this to the men who are plotting his death and they're going to accomplish that goal. He's referring to his marriage in this parable to his enemies. He's talking to the ones who want to slit his throat. And, 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 and the question is, why would he be talking about his marriage to them? With this parable, he's looking forward to his marriage. His enemies are saying, wedding, marriage? No, no wedding and marriage, funeral. Funeral. That was the headline on the Israeli <clears throat> newspaper this last week on the report of, the, um, of uh, Barack Lufan, who was an Olympic uh, kayaker, who was killed in the Tel Aviv attack by the terrorists, the Arab terrorists. Barack Lufan was, was, was planning on getting married to his fiancée, and the headline that announced his death read, A Funeral and Not a Wedding. As Christ's enemies listened to Christ alluding <clears throat> through this parable to his wedding to the church, they're thinking they'd want a funeral, not a wedding. So why was he bearing his heart to these murderers who were talking about his, <laughs> when he's talking about his wedding to the church? The reason is because just who he is. He looks at his enemies and he loves them. He looks at his enemies, he prays for them. This, this is the Lord who prays in Luke 23, 34, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He prayed, he prayed that, for the people as they were gambling away his last possessions on earth, his clothes. And they were aiming, and now he's talking to these people, and they're aiming to kill him. He's aiming to save them. And, and he's aiming to save them because he said in Luke 9.56, Luke 9.56, he says, the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. So even though they want to destroy them, he, wants, he, 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 he doesn't want to destroy them. Now, the Lord Jesus speaks here in this verse 6 of a remnant. He says a remnant. On the, uh, this is a remnant on the far side, and, and it's not the, the whole of the people. It's a remnant, but because as far as the whole of the people go, that was the verse before. In verse 5, the whole of the people, they are described as they made light of it, of the invitation to come to the wedding, the king's invitation. It says, they made light of it, they went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. <coughs> you know, there are some phrases in the, in, the, in, the, in the old English of the King James, and in case you didn't notice, I love the King James. But there's some phrases in the old age that are just so expressive, and this is one of them. This is great. In verse 5, they made light of it. They made light of it. You know, it, 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 when you think about it, God's servants make heavy of it. They make heavy the gospel as God's servants make heavy Romans 3.23, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But the lost make light of Romans 3.23 by saying, no, nah, no one's perfect. Uh, God's servants make heavy Romans 6.23, Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. The lost make light of Romans 6.23 by saying everyone dies, so what else is new? God's servants make heavy Revelation 20.15. Revelation 20.15. Revelation 20.15 says, Whosoever was not written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. But the light, but the lost, they make light of Revelation 20.15 by saying, I'll be there in the lake of fire with all my friends. God's servant make heavy 1 Corinthians 15.3. 1 Corinthians 15.3 says, 15, says, Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. But the lost make light of this. 1 Corinthians 15.3 by saying, I don't need anyone to die for my sin. I'll answer to God for my own sins. So this is the majority. They hear, they make light of it, and then they go on their business with two words. Two words that they say as they go away from hearing the gospel, and the two words are, not now. Not now. They see their present obligations, what they gotta do, their farm, their business, much more important than them becoming religious. So they go on with, not now, 
maybe later, which unfortunately, that really means never. So Jesus Christ wants the truths, these truths, to be heavy, heavy as a stone that sinks down deep into the waters of, of our ears. When he said in Luke 9.44, Luke 9.44, let these things sink down into your ears for the Son of Man shall be betrayed, delivered into the hands of men. So he calls the truths, Christ calls the truths, the truth, something that has to sink down to your ears. And that will not happen if a person makes light of the, of the truth. And, what, and, and that's what the majority do today. The majority of people do it. They make light of the truths of sin and judgment and salvation. And that's the majority. But then there's two remnants on either side of the majority. There's a remnant over here and there's a remnant over here. First, there's the remnant that does not make light of the gospel truth. And that's the remnant of Romans 9.27. Romans 9.27. A remnant shall be saved. That saved remnant have made the gospel truth heavy to sink down deep into their ears. And just as there's a remnant on this side that take seriously and believe themselves into Jesus Christ, there's an opposite remnant on the other side, which is the one we're reading about in verse 6. Verse 6, the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. Now, why does this remnant on this side attack God's servant so viciously? He said in John 15, 18, John 15, 18, Jesus said, if the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own, but because you are not of the world, but I've chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. It's because they hate Jesus Christ, and therefore they hate the servants of Jesus Christ. They see the servants of Jesus Christ as chosen. As he said, I've chosen you out of the world. Chosen to be saved, chosen to not be destroyed. And they say, if I'm going to be destroyed, then I'm going to make sure that they are the servants of Jesus Christ are destroyed. Now he tells us about this king who was, when this happened, was infuriated. And he sent his armies and destroyed the murderers and burned up the city in verse 7. Verse 7, when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. It all happened in 70 AD. It all happened in 70 AD. The armies came in, the Roman armies under Titus, and they burned Jerusalem. Isn't it strange that when he's telling this parable here, He's talking about the king's armies went out. Isn't it strange to see that the Roman armies are implied to be God's armies? So judgment <clears throat> fell, but it was not what the king wanted to do. The king was forced into it because of what the, the, the remnant, the evil remnant, did to his messengers. And he was very angry when the people made light of his invitation to come to the wedding of his son, but... Well, even with that, he was patient. He was waiting for the people to calm down. The king was waiting at that point like the father of the prodigal son who was waiting for this golden time in Luke 15, 17, Luke 15, 17, when it says and when, about the prodigal son. It says, when he came to himself, he said, <clears throat> how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and despair, and I perish with hunger. That's such a beautiful statement in Luke uh, 15, 17. He came to himself. He came to himself because it shows that his life of high rolling with prostitutes and wild living was not really himself. It was like the prodigal son had left himself when he went into that life, and it was like he had checked out of himself. And then after enough time in the pig pen, and, and after enough time of being starved, and after enough time of being utterly humiliated, the prodigal son came home inside the prodigal son. He came back to where he knew he should be. And that's the beauty of this phrase. He came to himself. 
It's really a very thought-provoking statement that the prodigal came to himself with an implication that the prodigal son had to first come home inside of himself before he ever physically came home to where his father was. And the, and the father of the prodigal son, he saw, when he saw that his son had come back home to himself before he walked up that driveway back home, the father of the prodigal son was so excited that he cut off his son from making his prepared speech. He didn't allow it to go on he, be about how he had sinned against God and how he had sinned against him before he could even get the words out of his mouth. The father is ordering a robe to be put on his back and a ring to be put on his finger and a fatted calf to be put in the oven. He's so overjoyed, the father. And that's the way it is for when one sinner comes to himself. That's the way it is when one sinner comes home inside of himself and then turns to God with those three words that are the key for God opening up this, this great outpouring of grace and mercy, and those three words are just simply, I have sinned. And that's what the king was hoping the people that he invited, that refused to come, would do after that first terrible response in verse three of they would not come. And the king was patient, and God is patient with that first response. And the king says, okay, okay, let's give them some time for the people to come to themselves and say those three golden words, I have sinned, and then we can get on with the wedding celebration and, and for my son. And that's where God is also. God is also. God is patient with sinners. He just want, he's waiting there like the father of the prodigal son. He's waiting there like the king. There's no jumping to judgment here. There's just the waiting. The patient waiting for the turnaround, the coming to self, the repentance. But <clears throat> during this time, the king was not just doing nothing. He sent out other servants. And that was the beauty of that word again in verse 4. God says again and again and again. Tell them, tell them, tell them. This is all uh, of what Isaiah 28.9 is about. Isaiah 28.9 where God says, whom shall he teach knowledge? Whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. That's why I really love to go down to the Del Mar Fair with the Child Evangelism Fellowship and teaching the children because, because that's how God looks at us. It's, it's not my mistake that God calls the Jewish people the children of Israel. It's for a reason. Because we, they, us, all need to be taught like children. And so that's why God asked this question, Isaiah 28, 9. Isaiah 28, 9, he says, Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? You know, those are two questions God's saying, let's see now. We want to teach knowledge. We want to teach doctrine. So how are we going to teach knowledge and doctrine? And then God says, I know. I know exactly who we are going to teach knowledge and doctrine to. I got it. God says, and then he explains to us, he explained to us how he's going to teach the, the, the people when he says in Isaiah 28.9, Isaiah 28.9, oh, it's them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. How old is a person? when he's weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast? Well, that depends on the person. That depends on, for me, I was only two weeks old when I was weaned, which explains why I'm so maladjusted in life. <laughs> but for my son Joshua, he was three years old, going on four. The only reason Cheryl ever stopped uh, nursing him is because in public one time he came up to her and lifted up her blouse, and she said, okay, that's enough. But that's the model that God holds up for the method of teaching doctrine and knowledge a three or four-year-old. And God says the method has to be Isaiah 28, 10, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. The method is repetition. Repeat, repeat, repeat. A little here, a little there, like with children. Not a lot at one time but a little at one time. Don't overwater the plants. Just give as much water as the ground can absorb. 
And that's what the king had in mind with the word again in verse 4. Let's invite them again. And the emphasis in verse 4 is on this word ready, ready in verse 4. Verse 4, all things are ready. The king had done everything. The king said in verse 4, come, all things are ready, come. And we can see how excited the king is was to be able to say that, that everything has been prepared, everything's ready. And if anyone said, if anyone said, well, what can I bring to the wedding? Shall I bring the salad? Shall I bring the meat? Shall I bring the dessert? And the king would answer, no, the salad is already prepared. The meat is ready and the dessert's all set. All you have to do is just bring yourself. Everything else has been prepared and all things are ready. That's like when God calls a person to come to Jesus Christ, and the person says, oh, I cannot come alone. i got to bring with me a whole set of good works to impress you, God. And God says, no, just come just as you are without one plea, except that, you're, except that the blood was shed for me. God says, just come, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling, O Lamb of God, I come. But the response of the next set of the king's messengers was that they made light of the king's invitation. They just, they mocked, they joked, they said, I have more important things to do. I'm too busy for you, God. But when, and then the small remnant took the servants and hurt them and even killed them. And then the king says, okay, that's it. I've reached my limit of patience. And he broke through in judgment. And God's patience has a, ju- has a limit. There's a limit. And after the judgment fell, then we get to see further the real heart of the king. The king didn't walk away from that and, and, and say, well, I feel good now to have destroyed my enemies, and I'm going home now, and we'll just forget about having this wedding celebration for my son. It all didn't work out the way I planned it. I'm just going to dismantle all the preparations for the wedding. And when Jesus Christ came to the house of Israel, and the house of Israel rejected him and made it clear they wanted nothing to do with him, Christ did not give up building his church. As a matter of fact, he said in Matthew 16, 18, Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Even if those gates of hell took on the shape of chief priests, scribes, and Pharisees, those gates of hell were not going to stop Jesus Christ from building his church. And that's why the king now turns to the servants and gives them a brand new commission. In verse 9, in verse 9, he says, Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find bid to the marriage. So here we see flexibility on the part of the king. Here we say, the king didn't say, well, that's it. Because the first group didn't respond to my invitation, then I've just lost heart. I'm not going to get hurt again. Um, um, And so, no. And we can feel in these words of the king here in verse 9, in excitement, in his voice, as he, as he says, go you therefore into the highways. He's excited because the king has regrouped, the king has picked himself up, the king has a new vision of highway people. The king sees many highway people coming off the highways into the king's banquet hall for the wedding of the son. And The king doesn't know these highway people, but the king is so flexible that he says, I'll get to know them. I'm willing to get to know the highway people, and I'm going to honor the highway people with the invitation to to, to be the king's guest at the wedding of his son. And what we see here in how the king has picked himself up and adopted this whole new vision it's got a couple lessons in here for us. One lesson is about what we should do when we've been disappointed and frustrated that we should be like the king, get a new vision. Like the king got for the highway people coming to his banquet. He wasn't thinking about the highway people before, but okay. This is what God did when Jesus Christ came to his own Jewish people in John 11, John 111, John 111 which says, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. Then what? God got a new vision for highway people, and those highway people are the Gentiles. And that's how the gospel came to be focused on the Gentiles. It was God who picked himself up after the disappointment and the frustration of such a poor response from the Jewish people, 
and God rebounded with a new vision, which Paul explained in Ro to the Roman Gentiles, the, the Gentiles who were in Rome, in Romans 11.11, 11, Romans 11.11, 11, when he said, I say then, have they stumbled, the Jewish people, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is coming to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. See, when Romans 11.11 11 says that through their fall, through the fall of the Jewish people, that salvation has come to the Gentiles, that was because of the new vision that God had for the Gentiles to make up the bride of Christ. And, but this is where the parable of the king departs from what God did. The king was totally finished, totally done with the first group, but God was not finished with the Jewish people who rejected Christ because in Romans 11, 11, God said that his goal with his new vision for the Gentiles in coming to salvation was, Romans 11, 11, for to provoke them to jealousy, to jealousy. God's intention in saving the Gentiles is, is of course, to save the Gentiles, but it's to, to make up the bride of Christ, but also to show the Jewish people what they are missing. Like a Jewish friend recently said to me, a Jewish friend recently said to me, you really believe in everlasting life? You really believe that? And that is a question of jealousy, of jealousy. That's a question, if you have everlasting life, then I'm jealous, I want everlasting life. That's what that question's about. You know, people oftentimes ask me, they say, how do I witness to a Jewish person? So oh, just tell me, how do I do it? Do I open the Old Testament and show them the prophecies like Isaiah 53 about Jesus Christ? What are the scriptures, I get asked? What are the scriptures in the Old Testament that are the same as the Romans road? What's the Jerusalem road to salvation? And I tell them, the way to witness to a Jewish person is to make them jealous for what you have in Jesus Christ, what they do not have. What do you have in Jesus Christ? We have real peace with God. Real peace with God. Romans 5.1, Romans 5.1. Therefore, in being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Without Jesus Christ, there's no real peace with God. There's, the restlessness is not taken away. The turmoil within. That peace comes from knowing the power of the blood of Christ to satisfy the wrath of God against our sins. We have, like my friend asked me, we have eternal life. John 17, 3, John 17, 3, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Without Jesus Christ, there's no eternal life. Eternal life doesn't start when we die. It already started the day we received Christ, when we were born again. We have a friendship with God. We have a friendship with God, because Jesus said, in John 15, 15, John 15, 15, Henceforth I call you not servants, serveth knoweth not what his friend doeth. I have called you friends. For the things which I have heard of my Father have I made known unto you. Without Jesus Christ, there's no real friendship with God. We have, in Jesus Christ, a continual source of cleansing from our sins. We have a fountain. We got a, sh we got a daily shower that we go and take. And that shower from sin is 1 John 1, 7 and 9. 1 John 1, 7 and 9. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Without the blood of Jesus Christ, there is no cleansing from sin. I don't care how many Yom Kippur's. I don't care how many throw them in the river and all everything else. The more that a Jewish person sees, we really do have peace with God. We really do have eternal life. We really do have friendship with God. We really do have a continual cleansing from our sins. The more there is that, 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 that jealousy, and that's what God wants. Now, we see specifically what the king said to his servants were three words. Three words in verse nine. He said, go, find, bid. Go, find, bid. First the king says, go. But he didn't just say go. 
in verse 9, there's a very important second word that he said after go, and that's the word ye. He said, go ye. And that word ye is very pointed. It's very personal. So when the king says, go ye, he's not saying, I want that people should go. The, the king is saying, I want that you should go. Go ye is a personal command. It's like the picture of Uncle Sam pointing his finger at you. I need you. And that's what God is saying to each one of us, that we should go and carry his message to the lost. Like the song says, someone far from the harbor you may guide across the bar. Brighten the corner where you are. So the next action word that the king command is find. Go find. When we tell a person the gospel that God has signed a peace treaty, God has signed a peace treaty with man and the ink that was used is the blood of Christ. And what we're doing when we say some things like that is we're trying to find that person who's going to respond to God's call to make peace with him through the blood of Christ. I mean, we're on the hunt. We're on the hunt for the person. We're on the search. We're looking out. We're, we're, we're doing what the king said in his second word, which is find. Find. You can't find unless you go. And then the third action word the king used is bid. Once we have personally gone, once we have found a person and shown, who's shown an interest, then we bid. Bid's an interesting word. It's stronger than the word invite because it means to, but bid means, means to like put a little friendly persuasion behind it there. A little passionate plea. A little gentle urging to, to move on. Don't, 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 don't delay about it. It, it, bid is uh, 2 Corinthians 5.11, 2 Corinthians 5.11. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. We persuade men. Knowing the terror of the Lord means that we know the stakes are high. Heaven and, heaven and hell's on the table here. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you, in Christ said, be ye reconciled to God. And so Paul, if the Apostle Paul was going to write his resume, he would write about himself, color me persuader. I'm a persuader. I'm a, because that's what Paul's life was. He was a persuader. Acts 18.4, Acts 18.4, Paul's described as, he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. But with all this persuasion, all this urging has to be done with the art of gentleness. The art of gentleness. Because 2 Timothy 2.24, 2 Timothy 2.24 says, The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him as will. So the art of gentleness is a persuasion, is, in persuasion is, is a sensitivity to know when we are starting to strive and then back off. The art of gentleness with persuasion is a sensitivity to know when we're starting to become forceful, overbearing, and then back off into a humble position of, Lord, please take over for here. Take this over. And now we see how the servants of the king were clear. They were very clear in their minds what the king wanted them to do. So they moved out immediately in verse 10. Verse 10, so those servants went out into the highways. There was no obstacle that was too great for those servants of the king. There was no highway that those servants looked at and said, oh, that highway is too hard. I'm not going there. No, they went into every highway that they could find. They were out there. And that picture of the servants going is so symbolic of the great missionary movements over the last 2,000 years, which has been in obedience to Christ's command, the Great Commission. In Mark 16, 15, Mark 16, 15, he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Christ's great command, his commission was <coughs> symbolized by the command of this king here in verse 9, verse 9, go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as you'll find, bid to the marriage. And the reason that the king told his servants to go into the highways and find as many as they could find 
was because the first group had rejected the king's invitation to come to the wedding. And the reason that Christ gave this great commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature is because the Jewish people had rejected the gospel. Had the Jewish people not rejected the gospel, they would have received as a nation this great commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's what he wanted them to be, as he called them a kingdom of priests in the beginning. So the service of the king, they took all comers, they took everyone they could find. Those servants did not put a filter on anyone from coming to the wedding. Anyone who has agreed, you come, you're welcome. That's like the gospel. That's like how the gospel has been preached. People have been asked to receive Christ by all kinds of methods. For example, in the, in the, the, the door-to-door efforts of the soul winners where the invitation is simply, if someone offered you a million dollars for free, wouldn't you take it? Well, God's offering you heaven for free. All you have to do is one, two, three, repeat after me. Just pray this one minute prayer and you're in. And the person leaves the door and that's, and that, and that, and that's uh, the soul winners are those who in verse 10, verse 10, went into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good. The wedding was furnished with guests. And then there was the, the missionary. There was a missionary one time in Central America, one of the countries there. He claimed to have gotten the whole country saved. That's what he claimed. Because he had an airplane. And mounted on his airplane was this big loudspeaker. And what he did is he went over the country and he flew over the towns round and round and round. And as he did with his microphone, he preached the gospel to the town down below with the loudspeaker. And, 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 and he led the people in the loudspeaker and the airplane, he led the people in the sinner's prayer. And then he asked the people below, raise your hand if you prayed that prayer. He said, everyone raise their hand down below. You don't know if they were waving hi, hello, whatever. <laughs> and, and so when he was finished, he said the whole country was saved. So there you go. Pilate, who was just another one of verse 10, verse 10. He went out into the highways and gathered together as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was finished with, with, furnished with guests. And what's important to see in this parable is that the king did not give his servants any instructions for how to qualify those who invited to the wedding. The king just told them, go into the highways, get as many as you can find, urge them to come to the wedding, and he never said, Don't bring the gospel down to the level of one, two, three, repeat after me. The king just said in verse nine, in verse nine, go ye therefore into the highways, then as many as you shall find, bid to the marriage. One, two, three, repeat after me, that's okay. The king never says, don't bring the gospel down to the level of flying circles in an airplane overhead and ask people to raise their hand. The king just said, verse nine, go therefore into all the highways and as many as you'll find, bid them to the marriage. Fly in an airplane, go overhead, ask the people on the ground, raise their hand, accept Christ, that's okay. So when the service of the king were finished and they had gathered all that they had to come to the wedding, Christ said that he ended up in the gathering, describing the gathering in verse 10 as good and bad. And the wedding was furnished with the guests. And now we see that it was the king in verse 11 who the king came in to see the guests. So it's not the job of the servants to look over the guests who came to the wedding. It was the king who did that job himself. This was the king's job to go in and inspect, go in and look over the guests who had come. <clears throat> and when he came in there, there was this man. And this man stood out like a sore thumb. And the king looked over the group there And he saw the guests there, and he saw the guests were happy, and he saw the guests had taken the time to take off their normal daily dirty clothes, and they're all dressed in their best clothes, clean clothes, only worn for Sunday best, special occasions. But there was this man, this man there, and he was dressed so dramatically different from everyone else. This man had not bothered to change his clothes He was still dressed in his dirty work clothes. He was filthy. And and this man didn't think that it was such a special occasion that he needed to go home first and take a bath 
and changes to his clean Sunday best clothes. He just sat there with everyone else. We can imagine how bad he must have smelled with all the body odor. Oh man, I've been on an airplane sometime. I walked in there and I said, oh, whoa. This body odor is so strong, I wish I had COVID and couldn't smell. <laughs> and no one wanted to sit by this man. And we can imagine how his clothes had dirt and grime on it, and his hands and his face were dirty, and he smelled and looked like Charlie Brown character Pigpen. And, and, and as that person sat there, he began to feel, he, he, maybe he got a whiff of himself. He goes, man, I stink. And, 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 he, and he felt so out of place. And the stench of his body odor began to bother him. And, and he felt so dirty and unclean among all these other guests. He felt so embarrassed to be there in that state he was in. And we can see that man wishing, I wish I had just taken the time before coming to this wedding to have gone home, had a good bath, Wear my best clothes. But he's sitting there, as he's sitting there thinking, he's saying to himself, it's too late. It's too late. I'm already here at the wedding and I feel so out of place and, and I'm just hoping that I can just maybe blend in with everyone else, that no one's going to notice me. But that's not what happened. As a matter of fact, the worst happened to him. It was not the other guests who were pointing at him like that. It was the worst person who could have singled him out that fixed his sight on him in verse 11. Verse 11, the king came in to see the guest, and he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. So as the king approached that man, the man wished that he could just at that moment become invisible. And, and, and as that man saw the king just getting closer and closer to him, that man felt like a mouse looking for the hole to jump into because the cat's coming. He just felt so dirty. He, he, he felt so out of place. He smelled so bad. And the king came up to him, and the king asked that man the question that he hoped he'd never be asked. Verse 12, verse 12. He saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having on a wedding garment? And in that question, that man heard the king say to him, Did you smell yourself? How could you decide to come here stinking like you do? Do you know how your face and your hands look? How could you come here without washing your face and hands? Do you not see how dirty and grimy your clothes are that you're wearing? How dare you come here without nice, clean clothes? And the man had nothing to say from those questions by the king. The man felt just this flood of guilt and shame and remorse just come over his head. And we can see that man just hang his head in shame as it says at the end of verse 12, verse 12, he was speechless because a person outside of Jesus Christ is clothed in what God describes, Isaiah 64, 6, Isaiah 64, 6, we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. We are filthy with sins. The very best clothes we have Isaiah 64, 6, all our righteousness are called in Isaiah 64, 6, filthy, th filthy rags. And in the Hebrew, that word is used menstrual rags. That's how God describes us, our clothing. So to try to come to heaven like that is like that man sitting in that wedding, stinking with dirty clothes on. But receiving Christ as Savior, it all changes. It means we get cleaned up from our sins. Because Revelation 1.5, Revelation 1.5 says, Jesus Christ, who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Ephesians 5.26, Ephesians 5.26, as we just read, he sanctifies and cleanses the church with the washing of the water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it should be holy without blemish. Receiving Christ means to get new clothes, which is the righteousness of Christ. Romans 13, 14, Romans 13, 14. Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah 61, 10, Isaiah 61, 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments and as a bride adorneth herself 
with her jewels. So cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, clothed by the, in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, we can sit confidently at a wedding celebration knowing that we are clean by Christ, knowing that we are beautifully clothed in the righteousness of Christ, and we smell good. We smell good because we smell like the sweet smell of Christ. 2 Corinthians 2.15, 2 Corinthians 2.15. We are unto God a sweet savor of Christ. Now, the king did not say, say about that man who smelled bad, looked bad, had bad clothes on. He didn't say, it's okay, let him stay. He didn't do that. The king said to get him out of that wedding party in verse 13. Verse 13, then said the king to the servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away, cast him into outer darkness, so she'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's what happens to anyone who tries to slip into heaven being unclean from his sins, with the stench of his own sins, and with his clothes of the filthy rags of his own righteousness, cast into hell. Then the Lord explained what happened with all this, with this one statement in, in, in verse 14, many are called, but few are chosen. The king had used his servants to go into the highways and gather as many as they could find, and they did both good and bad. And as soul winners go door to door, they gather in with their one, two, three, repeat after me prayer, as many as they can find, both good and bad. And the soul winners can't see who is good and who is bad, who really meant that prayer and who just went through the motions. And in the church, there are those who look like they're saved, but they're not. And there are those in the church who do not look like they are saved, but they are. And there's the good and there's the bad. And we can't see who the good and the bad is. And that pilot in the sky with his loudspeaker, seeing all those people raising their hands, he can't see who is really saved and who's just raising their hands to say hello. He doesn't know who's good and who's bad. And many people at the doors praying the sinner's prayer are the called. And many people in the church, are, they are the called. And many people raising their hands under an airplane, they're the called. But when the king came out to see who came to the wedding, the king saw who was clean, who smelled good, who was clothed nicely. And the king chose who stays based on that. Many are called, few are chosen. God looks at everyone who tries to come into heaven. And God sees who has really been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. God sees who really has the sweet smell of Jesus Christ on them. God sees who's really clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And based on that criteria, God chooses who comes to heaven. Because, verse 14, many are called but few are chosen. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for preparing everything. The blood of Christ, the clothes of Christ, the savor of Christ, making it all ready, Lord. Thank you for that. And thank you, Lord, that the gospel invitation still, to, still is valid today. Whosoever will, let him come. In Jesus' name, amen.